Ruth Anderson, you were Ruth Smith, uh, the Labour MP, uh, until that last general election. Now, I said to you when we were organised this interview, I wanted to talk to you about your experience of being a Jewish Labour MP during a very difficult period, and you pulled me up on that and said, I'm not just a Jewish Labour MP. Tell me why you pulled me up on that. I think it's the one thing I really resent, and I said it to Corbyn at the time, that he would rue the day that he made me a Jewish Member of Parliament. Because up until that, I've been campaigning for the Labour Party, I've been part of the Labour Party my whole life. I come from a family a part that's part of the Labour movement. It's who we are, it's what we were. I door knocked for the first time during the 92 general election when I was 11. Like this was just who I was. And I'd never been a Jewish anything. I was a Labour activist, I was a feminist, I was a Brit who happened, all of those things, who happened to be Jewish. And suddenly, from 2016 onwards, the only bit of my identity that seemed relevant for certain people was the fact I also happened to be Jewish. And I can't tell you how much I resented it. Not because I'm Jewish, that I am so proud of, but because they turned it on its head and they made that as if that was all I was. And I wasn't. All of my friends, like, you didn't care that I was Jewish. Like, I think, I'm not even sure you would have thought about the fact I was Jewish. Mm. I was, was a mate. Yeah. Like, it was not, you know. I'm not even sure I knew that you were Jewish, actually, no. before the whole anti-Semitism Yeah. I was thing. someone who'd always been around, who'd campaigned, who'd been part of the trade union movement. And then these people decided that that was the only thing I was. I wasn't. I was a member of parliament in my own right. I was someone that cared about national security and defence that was campaigning on holiday hunger um, before Marcus Rashford. Uh, yeah, it was all of the things that who I was, and then they decided that there was one thing that was relevant to me, and worse, then they made that thing a political football and m changed my life beyond all recognition. And it would have been so easy to stop. So that's why, you know, I'm adamant also at this point, I've got a new life, right? Like that had to be, it was part of the name change too. Last chapter, new chapter. But I was just so, how dare they? So when the Labour Party went through this period, yeah. when it was mired in allegations of anti-Semitism, you said that that period changed your life. I just wondered how it impacted you. On, did it impact you on a daily basis? In your own words. So um, it's easy to just think about this as sort of moments of crisis, and especially after the 20 after 2018 into 2019, when it was sort of a daily occurrence. But actually, for me, everything changed on the 30th of June, 2016. Now, prior to that, I had raised that the issues of anti-Semitism with, um, with Corbyn and the leadership nearly every week from January, 2016. Um, I was vice chair of the Parliamentary Labour Party. I had a meeting with Corbyn and with others, parliamentary committee, um, every week and was raising the fact that there was issues. We'd already had the investigation into what was happening, the Jam Royal investigation into what was happening at Oxford Labour Club. And so anti-Semitism was a thing, which is why Shami Chakrabarti had been brought in. And then there was the launch of the Shami Chakrabarti report and my interactions and what happened at the event, which the repercussions of that changed my Just life beyond that. Just explain what happened at that event. So, so the Labour Party held a... Um, an investigation really into anti-Semitism within the Labour Party. It was commissioned by the leader of the, the then leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, Shami Chakrabarti announced the findings at a press conference. You were in the audience. I was in the audience. I was invited. I had participated. I'd been interviewed by Chakrabarti, and I um, and the leader's office had invited me to, and had requested my presence. Vice Chair of the Parliamentary Labour Party, Jewish MP. I arrived very early in the morning. It was really weird. I mean, context is always everything, right? So this was June 2016. We just had the Brexit referendum. And um, on the Monday of that week, many people had resigned from, including me, had refused to serve Jeremy Corbyn going forward for lots of different reasons. Actually, on that Monday, when I resigned, I refused to publish my letter. I was the only one of those of us who resigned because I'd said I couldn't serve him based on anti-Semitism anymore. But I also had put in, I know how damaging it would be if I published this letter. Little did I realise what was going to happen later that week. So I was at the launch of the event. Corbyn staff had turned it into a, uh, tried to turn it into a rally for Corbyn. So you'd sort of assume that an event to talk about anti-Semitism and how the Labour Party was going to tackle anti-Semitism 
would have lots of Jews present and would be a very serious, responsible thing. And actually, there were loads of people that were just there as Jeremy Corbyn supporters. And it had a really toxic feel before it started. It was, there was something in the air, you know, when you walk into a certain room and there's something really odd. Anyway, I was sitting in front of journalists, journalists behind me, man came up and was handing out leaflets. And I repeat, context is everything. We'd lost Jo Cox two weeks before. You'll remember the person that murdered her, assassinated her, shouted traitor as they were, as they attacked her. Um, and someone started handing out leaflets calling the Parliamentary Labour Party traitors um, and came up and refused to give me one but was handing them out to journalists. And I went, excuse me. And uh, they said, well, no, we're not giving it to you. And um, a journalist behind me said, it's Jewish MP at an event about anti-Semitism. Give her the leaflet and he refused to. He went, oh, but she's a Jewish member of parliament. What's her name? And he took out a book and wrote down my name. Now claims he doesn't know I was. And I was wearing a very prominent star day. Claims he didn't know I was Jewish. Nonsense. Um, anyway, one of the journalists passed me um, a copy of the press release. Um, just so I could read it. Like it wasn't, I took a photo of it, read it. Um, and then we got, Shami did her thing. Uh, Corbyn was there to answer questions too. Um, and the person that had been handing out this leaflet press release was called to ask a question and um, uh, and accused me of working hand in hand with the Telegraph, which in theory would be normal, like whatever. But we're at an event talking about anti-Semitism in the book that had just been handed out, the report where it says, accusing Jews of working with the media is an anti-Semitic trope. Well, it definitely is when you're talking in that environment, in that space, talking about what Jews had experienced in the Labour Party. I stood up and said, how dare you? Corbyn and Chakrabarti said nothing. And the rest of the room turned on me and started shouting at me. And you walked out. And you? I walked out. And I was really upset. Um, it was a national news story. And I got my first substantive death threats that night. So life changed immediately. And death threats became a fact of your life, didn't they? Normal part of life. I mean, it's really easy to say, like, at the time, and you know, like, it's just normal, like, all right, I've had another death threat. Um, but normal life was different. And the bit that was really worse, is this is, I know you, there are bits of this, like, got to engage and embrace the dark humour. Um, but I had, I was wearing an, an Apple Watch. I'm sure I'm not meant to say the brand, but never mind. Um, and at that point, all of my Twitter notifications came up. So actually, the death threats and abuse and horrible stuff was physically coming onto my body. Like, it sounds like a really... Yeah. yeah, I've never been able to wear it again. And so from that point on, uh, I never travelled alone. Um, I wasn't allowed on public transport for three years by myself. I had to move home in London um, on the advice of the police because they weren't confident they could sec secure my old house. Like, everything changed. And some of it, you'll really appreciate. It's really difficult being a member of parliament and not being able to tell people where you're going. So, you know, my, there was a police officer at every surgery, which must have been awful for some of the people who were coming to see me. It wasn't fair, not for, you know, not only for me, but for the people that I was representing. It was really, it was really tough. And being the job of, you know, being an MP is long hours and you just power through. And I don't think you realise till you're through the other sides, what damage was done and the impact on those people that love you too. Because I just, you know, this was about me, so I just kept going. But, oh my God, what I put my staff through, what I put my mum through, anyone that loved me sort of was living and breathing this and couldn't do anything about it. It's, I don't think it's controversial to say that Keir Starmer made it one of his priorities to... Oh, the man's a mensch. <laughs> What's a mensch? It's a good man. <laughs> it's Yiddish for a very good man. He's a very good man. Um, so this week, yeah, Diane Abbott has been accused of being anti-Semitic. She has been, she's lost the Labour whip just mm. this week. How did you feel when you read, when you read the, the, the story? Oh, so sad. And it's so thoroughly depressing on every level. Diane Abbott, regardless, we're not on the same wing of the Labour Party. She is friends with lots of people who have made my life quite difficult. 
She was also the first black woman to be elected. She is an icon in her own lifetime. That is an extraordinary thing. I don't want her political career to end like this. I find all of this so sad. And honestly, I'm tired of my identity being used as a political football within the party that I have dedicated my life to. I'm just sad. I know that is, a ch we need to move on from this chapter. I want us to be talking about how we form government. I want us to be talking about how we beat the Tories. I want us to be talking about how we're going to fix the communities that I live in in Stoke. I, you know, how we're going to win back your old seat and my old seat. I want us to provide a level of hope for the future for the country. This is sad and miserable and takes us back to a place I don't want to be in. We need to find a way through this. We need to find a way through where there is a level of dignity for Diane too, because it's really important for her community and there is no hierarchy of racism. Racism is racism. She has had horrible experiences. I want everybody just to move forward and we're meant to be on the same side. And she did swiftly apologise, I should, I, should, I should say that. Uh, shortly after, a few months after, he became chief executive of the Index on Censorship. This is an organisation which campaigns for freedom of speech. You still yep. hold that role now. Is freedom of speech really under threat? So yes, both yes and no. Like where we live, we're really lucky and we need to cherish the rights that we've got. And one of my big frustrations is actually about self-censorship. There is a huge amount and number of issues where I think lots of people feel really uncomfortable, especially because of social media, about raising their head above the parapet, about getting involved in a debate, about having an argument. Um, especially if they're not 100% sure of their facts because the world just lands on top of you, right? So why on earth would anyone volunteer for that? So I completely appreciate why they might, might not want to, but it does mean that our national conversation is polarised and all we hear from is the extremes and not the moderate middle. And this country is moderate. This country votes for moderates. This country just wants a nice life. Like our electorate are quite clear on the things that matter to them and typically it's about them and their families and their life experiences and what they're going to have. They don't care about some of the issues and so they're not going to get involved in them. So we're seeing a lot of self-censorship and that really worries me. And when you add that to, from a political point of view, this anti-woke nonsense that we're seeing, I thoroughly resent, I can't tell you how annoyed and angry it, get, it makes me, that people on the political right have tried to claim and own the idea of freedom of speech. Like, I've got the right to say whatever I want to, even if it offends you. Yes, you have. But actually, every single progressive change in the UK, whether it's the you know, Equality Act, whether it's um, gay marriage, whether whatever it is, the right for women to vote, all of those things came from progressive campaigns where people utilised and claimed their freedom of speech, of association, of their right to protest. Those are progressive values. We cherish them, we hold on to them. And the left needs to remember how we got what we got and we need to fight and defend free expression and we need to reclaim it. And I think that's part of this conversation. So we're really lucky, but you've always got to protect what you've got, right? Ruth Anderson, it's the first time you've, you've done the channel and I think people will really enjoy listening to you find some of it hard because you, you talked about your lived experience through a very difficult period. But I think it's going to be a great watch. Thank you. Pleasure.